Hey everyone, before we get into today's episode, I just wanted to remind you that we have a ton of extra content over on our Patreon. We do movie watch parties, special Patreon bonus episodes, and all other sorts of wacky stuff that you can access easily if you head on over to patreon.com slash film whiskey. Look, Bumble knows you're exhausted by dating. All the, must not take yourself too seriously, and 6-1 since that matters, and What do I even say other than, hey? (sighs) Well, that's why they're introducing an all-new Bumble. With exciting features to make compatibility easier, starting the chat better, and dating safer. They've changed, so you don't have to. Download the new Bumble now. In 1964, director Stanley Kubrick and star Peter Sellers gave the world an inane and biting comedy that pressed all the right buttons. (laughs) Oh, that was a good one. Do, do, you get it? There? do you get it? Do you get it? Do you get it? Because, 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 boom. In 2023, we take a return trip to Kentucky to drink perhaps the most American whiskey we could find. <laughs> the film is Dr. Strangelove or How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love the Bomb. The whiskey is Old Bardstown Bottled and Bond. And we'll review them both. This is The, the Film and Whiskey, whiskey Podcast. Podcast. Welcome to the Film and Whiskey Podcast, where each week we review a classic movie and a glass of whiskey. I'm Bob Book. I'm Brad G. And this week we are looking at Stanley Kubrick's 1964 black comedy, Dr. Strangelove, or How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love the Bomb, which is the quickest and and, uh, final way I will say that whole title again, because we're getting into assassination of Jesse James territory on that. Who who assassinated Jesse James? I don't quite remember. It was a coward. <laughs> oh, he, was, okay. he was cowardly for sure. <laughs> uh, here, heretofore known simply as Doctor Strange Love for the purposes of uh, our sanity. I'm gonna use the full name every single time. <laughs> I know you will, man. I just, I don't know why I try anymore, Brad. <laughs> Bob, you know what rarefied air this movie enters? Mm. Uh, no. The 90-minute movie. Oh, dude. I say it every dude. time. As God intended. Yeah. A 90-minute film. Like, and I, this one I think is an hour and 33 minutes. Uh, I, I still consider it a 90-minute film. Yeah, we'll round How down. How many, yeah, you know, we'll round down. How many films, percent-wise, of the, what, 200-plus movies we've watched for this podcast, would you say fall into the 90-minute the film? Oh, uh, 30% maybe. Oh, I was thinking less. Yeah. I was thinking it was like 15 or 20. Do you know what it is though? I think it's because when we get a 90 minute movie, or at least when we did in the past, we, we would just kind of gloss over it and it'd be like, oh, that was enjoyable. And Mm -hmm. now I feel like we have gone through so many four hour slogs that we're, we, we like to praise the 90 minute movie more. So I think we're weighting them probably more than we should or could be. But yeah. I, I do kind of think it's probably closer to a third than we might think it is. You know what we need to do, Bob? I think we need to do, you know, forget these stupid director miniseries. We need to do a miniseries just like uh, as an ode to the 90 minute movie. I would like that. I would like to do a whole season of that. But then when we return to the real world and we start watching three hour movies again, we're going to hate ourselves. <laughs> we sure are, man. We will go from being cinephiles to cinephobes at that point. <laughs> <laughs> afraid of cinema the movement is real my friends <laughs> all right man let's start talking about dr strange love this is the second in our three movie kubrick miniseries now we had already done 2001 way back in season one or two i believe and so last week we watched the shining this week we're watching strange love next week we're watching uh paths of glory so we're going in reverse chronological order and we are going to be operating in three wildly different genres and so I guess, Brad, I- I'm assuming this was your first time watching Dr. Strangelove, right? It sure was. Just to, just fill me in a little bit on the complete and utter whiplash effect from The Shining to this movie. <laughs> well, honestly, we luckily went to New York City in between watching The Shining and watching Dr. Strangelove. Mm-hmm. And so I feel like all memory 
of The Shining had been wiped from my soul. <laughs> And I was able to enter with like a fresh palette yeah. into uh, Dr. Strangelove or how I learned to stop worrying and love the bomb. Well, that's good. That's good news. So it wasn't so much that you were uh, like myself wondering at some points, how on earth did the same guy make both of these movies? Because they're both technically so brilliant and such great examples of their respective genres. But it is so hard to find a director that can operate so well in both of those genres. Yeah, I mean, it honestly reminds me of when we did our Rob Reiner uh, little mini series, where we were like, how does this guy operate in horror and in courtroom drama and in comedy and like knock the ball out of the park on all of them? Mm -hmm. Yeah, basically what we're saying here is Rob Reiner is as important a director as Stanley Kubrick. Yeah, I mean, obviously. <laughs> Is, hey, is that not like well known in the, no, in the I, cinephile community? Apparently it's a hot take. I don't understand. But <laughs> hey, I do want to give you a gold star as we get into this today because you have not yet referred to him as Stanley Kubrick. You know, I, I did my research and by research, I mean, I showed my wife his name and asked her how she would pronounce it. And she said Kubrick. And, and I was like, like, man, she's never wrong. So I might as well. Yes. Just lean into is, it. Yeah. That's the truth. Honestly, though, I like I'd be curious because I feel like I'm not the only person out there who, upon first glance at his name, would assume it's pronounced Kubrick. Mm. Like, like, I can't be the only one. There's other people out there who do the same thing. Maybe that'll be the poll on uh, Spotify this time around. I'll say, how do you <laughs> yes. pronounce it? Kubrick or Kubrick? <laughs> All right, dude, uh, I think we have vamped long enough. It's time to get into our first segment of the day, which we call Brad Explains. Brad's going to give us the movie plot with only 60 seconds ticking on the clock. So let's go ahead and hear your take with this little segment that we call Brad Explains. Brad Explains is the part of the podcast where Brad breaks down the plot of the movie that he has just seen, often for the first time. We've already established this is his first time with Dr. Strangelove. Brad, my secret motive today is to make our episode on Dr. Strangelove as long as the movie so that you can just play it as a DVD commentary over the movie. Uh, that's always my intention with 90 minute movies, uh, you know, because I just feel like eventually Criterion Collection will pick up one of these episodes and say this needs to be on our Blu-ray for this movie. Yeah. I mean, at some point we will be like the sole writers for all of the, you know, little <laughs> booklets that come in the in the movies. Yeah, it's, that's the goal. It's just going to be Bob and Brad. I just really I love the idea of like at this point in the movie, it's probably like George C. Scott taking a phone call with his secretary <laughs> in bed. And all you hear on the audio track is the Brad Explains theme song. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, it's perfect. <laughs> all right, man, you have 60 seconds on the clock to spoil this movie. If you've not seen Dr. Strangelove, hit pause here. Go watch the film. Come back and listen along with us. But Brad, you have a job to do. One minute on the clock and go. Dr. Strangelove, or How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love the Bomb, is a film about the mostly about the American generals and politicians who have found out that a American Air Force commander, Jack Ripper, has executed attack uh, attack order R, some some sort of thing, attack R, which essentially means that all of the bombers in the air are going to go drop their nuclear payloads on Russia. Everything that follows is them trying inanely and frantically and uh, ineffectually to stop the bombs from being dropped. And in the midst of that, we have our president talking to the Russian premier, trying to convince him that it was an accident. And finally, finishing out the day by saying that they're just going to create a brand new genetically pure race that's going to live underground for 100 years and have sex with a lot of hot women. And then the world gets blown up. And that's the end of the and film. Then everything gets blown up. Boom. <laughs> All right, man. Uh, I have been thinking long and hard about, well, long and hard is actually an innuendo for where I want to go with this, but. <laughs> All right, guys, it's been a great episode. I'm going to take off. Buckle in, folks, because we're talking phallic symbols. Uh, <laughs> no. Uh, <laughs> man, I threw myself off there. I have been thinking about where I want to start this episode, and I'm going to tip my hand with my let's make it a double really early on here because. Like many great satires, one of the things I love about this movie 
is the naming of the characters and how ridiculous the names of everything and everyone in this movie are. So everything from the fort being called like Fort Burpleson or whatever, all the way through to the fact that the president's name is Merkin Muffley. Like, it's just they're they're really <laughs> dirty and stupid names. You know, the guy that uh, George C. Scott plays, the general who is uh, uh, sexually frustrated and uh, just a meathead. His name is General Turgidson and, you know, turgid meaning like backed up, distended. Like, I just I love that Kubrick is not messing around when it comes to how over the top stupid he is making the characters in his movie all the way down to the naming of them. I don't know if turgid means backed up and distended, Bob. I think it means like full of blood and and vigor and life. Well, there you go. Swollen. Now, this, <laughs> Swollen is what, this is what Google says. If you will. Swollen, distended, or congested. Oh, okay. All right. But it all gets back to the point that this movie is totally and completely about sex. Like everything in this movie is about, uh, I don't know, can I speak freely, Brad? I, I mean, please, please, Bob. I think we've earned the right. This whole movie is about how the world is run by idiots and the nuclear nuclear arms race is a dick measuring contest. And mm -hmm. literally everything in this movie is an innuendo for the dick measuring contest that's going on, whether it's how horny everyone is or how uh, sexually frustrated everyone is. You know, the crazy Jack Ripper character develops his conspiracy theory as a result of the fact that he's impotent. And instead of just acknowledging that he is impotent, he blames the Russians and communism and then starts World War Three, you know, in fluoride uh, in fluoride, which, you know what? Like, how weirdly prescient is that conspiracy <laughs> theory? It's not a conspiracy theory, Bob. No, it's real. It started in 1946. Flor he taught me. Fluoride is a commie plan <laughs> to slowly kill off all of our children's brain cells. All right, so I guess all of my talk of, of phalluses being backed up, Brad, uh, I'm going to turn the floor over to you here because I don't want that associated with my name and ask you, I guess generally, how did this movie work for you on the level of satire? And then also, like, sub-question, the fact that it all boils down to a dick measuring contest. Does that ring true to you in the world that the movie is trying to create? See, here's the thing, Bob, if this is going to be a side by side commentary track with the film, I, I think what we actually need to do is just go case by case throughout the film and, and like fully explain for the listening and viewing audience <laughs> what each sexual <laughs> symbol means. Let's do it, in, man. In like great detail. Yeah. Yep. Do you remember that episode of How I Met Your Mother where the where Brian Cranston builds the building that looks like a penis? Yes. <laughs> and I just want to keep inserting that guy's reaction where he just keeps saying, that's a penis over and over. <laughs> I think that this movie works like 80 percent well. Mm. There's a there's a few moments that it gets a little slow. There's a few moments where I, I'm not always sure where he's going. But most of the time, he is not being subtle. Mm -mm. Like, from top to bottom, he is making fun of every single level of the American military, from the people flying the planes to the person running the entire country. Yep. Like, they're all idiots, and they're all, you know, at the end of the day, willing to put on a cowboy hat and ride the bomb down into World War III. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, and it's not even just limited to the American military, right? Like, it sends up the British and it sends up the Russians. Like, when he's talking to the Russian premier on the phone, the ambassador is like, hey, listen, I think he's probably drunk. So, like, tread lightly. You know, I just, I, I love that in the middle of the Cold War, Kubrick had started developing this project based on a book called Red Alert, which is a very serious and tense book. And he starts working on it and realizes that it's a lot more work to try to avoid making it seem absurdly funny. And so he mm -hmm. gets like halfway through the project and realizes this needs to be a comedy. And I think that we've talked about this in past episodes about satire. And this is what I was going to say with my let's make it a double thing. I think this really for for conversation's sake, Brad, I think the obvious comparison point here is the great dictator, which we just did, you know, a couple months ago. Mm -hmm. There is something about. Comedy speaking to current events in a way that seems less didactic and less 
condescending than a drama would be. And we'll talk in a little bit about a movie that came out right after this with basically the same plot that was a drama. But I just love the ballsiness that it takes to make a comedy like this in the middle of the thing happening. And I feel like it makes it makes it much more palatable to audiences. Not that Kubrick is necessarily wanting to be a nihilist, but to essentially say, hey, I'm really concerned that the people that are in charge of the nuclear weapons in our world are idiots and or are swayed by these ridiculous you know, ideals of masculinity. And that like at any moment we are hinging on the destruction of our planet. Right. It's easy for us to look back on this 60 years later and say, like, wow, what a what a cool statement to make. But he's making it in the middle of the thing happening, which I think adds a level of gutsiness to it that you kind of have to acknowledge when you're talking about this movie. Yeah, I mean, really, you could consider Kubrick the like original hipster, right? That like (laughs) he was hating America way before it was cool to hate on America. Mm. And I, I think that. If I can offer one thing in defense of America in the way that he describes them in this film, at the end of the day, none of this happened. Like, here we are 60 years later, and nobody, you know, was so offended by the dick measuring contest that they actually sent a bomb to, you know, attack each other. Mm -hmm. So, like... We did it. We're still here. We did it. Yeah, we're still here. We're still going. Nobody's, Nobody's detonated a nuke. Uh, in in a war situation ever since, you know, America did it at Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So, like, we're doing great, man. Yep. I Yeah, I don't know what to, <laughs> I don't know where to go from that, man. <laughs> USA, USA, question mark. I want to ask you this, because you are of the two of us, you are more on the conservative side of politics than I am. Mm-hmm. And I think that sometimes when we watch movies that interrogate aspects of Americana or American ideals or the government or whatever. I think that sometimes I hear you say things like this filmmaker hates America. I don't know that I necessarily get the vibe that he hates America. And I'm wondering, like, from your perspective, do you see that in Kubrick necessarily? And what would the movie, how would you recommend he remedy that so that it comes across that he doesn't hate America? If that's what you see here. Yeah, I mean, at the very least, he is very condescending towards America, right? Like, you know, you've said this. He lives in London most of his life, Mm -hmm. correct? He does. Yeah. And and so the British here, you know, earlier you said that the British don't come off quite as, you know, clean. I don't know if I get that. Like the only sane character in the movie ends up being the British officer, Mm -hmm. right? Sure. And so to me... Every single aspect of this movie seems designed to make fun of mostly Americans, but also also the Russians, right? Mm-hmm. Like the uh, the ambassador is ridiculous and you know buffoonish. The unseen premier is also ridiculous and buffoonish. The president is ridiculous and buffoonish, and almost even foppish, you might say. Mm-hmm. And so. To me, it seems very obvious that Kubrick is meaning this as a very biting and, to be honest, just mean commentary on America and Americans in general. And even like when you talk about the the people on the airplane, like the the way he shows who who gets to be the pilot, it's this, you know, redneck hillbilly who just accepts the orders as if they're letter of the law and, and you know, gives a whole speech about how, the, you know, they must be right in all this. I don't know. To me, it seems fairly obvious that he is uh, dismissive of American ideals in this, to put it lightly. And I guess for me, like, if that's his prerogative, then like, cool, man, good for him. I I just happen to disagree with a lot of it. Hmm. Yeah, I'm I'm just kind of... I'm interested in what you're saying. I don't know if I necessarily agree with everything you're saying, but it reminds me, I've been listening to this podcast recently uh, called Do We Get to Win This Time? I think I was telling you about this the other day, Brad. It's a eight part mini podcast series about Vietnam War movies and how they were introduced into Hollywood, how they shifted their viewpoints over time. Uh, it's really fascinating. And I think one of the big takeaways from that show is 
that a lot of the people who ended up making Vietnam War movies were Vietnam vets. And that, you know, Vietnam vets are this really underserved population because they came home and were rejected by veterans from other wars because they lost and they were rejected by the general population who was so opposed to the war that they took it out on the veterans themselves, too. And I say all that to say I've had this on the brain recently. I don't necessarily know that interrogating aspects of American life that you think are wrong or that need that you feel need to be called out is necessarily the same thing as hating America. You know what I mean? And I think that that's where I'm like, I don't see that Kubrick hates America, but I think that it's very similar to what we saw with like David Lean in all of his movies interrogating this idea of Britishness. I don't know that I would say David Lean hates Great Britain, but I think there are elements that he found needed to be addressed or at least explored in his movies. And I think that's kind of more what I'm seeing here. And I'm just wondering what you think of that. I I think on a basic level, the difference between a David Lean and a Kubrick is that Lean has a lot more charm about the way he does it. And he's a lot less uh, brutal in the way he employs his viewpoints hmm. like you know on, on a very simple level he's much more british about it than kubrick <laughs> is you know like yeah. there's a there's a sense of dignity and respect to the way he questions britainness whereas kubrick like there is no way in the world david lean could make a commentary on great britain the way kubrick made a commentary on america hmm. and that like this commentary on america is in like there is not a single moment where you have any respect for the Americans in this movie. Mm -hmm. Like, tell me a single time where you're like, man, like that was a positive view of America as a whole and its leaders. Yeah. No, I think that's a great point. You know, whereas like think about Bridge on the River Kwai, like, you know, Sir Alec Guinness is portrayed in a lot of admirable and dignifying ways. And he has his moments where he recognizes he was wrong. And like, you know, he's he's portrayed in a respectable way. But here we are in Dr. Strangelove or How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love the Bomb. And <laughs> everybody is a buffoon. Everybody is an ass. Everybody is just worried about getting some like. Yeah. There are no redeeming qualities. And so that's why I, I think I can pretty confidently say that whether or not the man I've never met, Stanley Kubrick, hated America, he made a film that would make you believe he has no fond feelings for his motherland. That's how I'm going to advertise this episode. Noted Kubrick hater Brad G calls yes. Kubrick a commie bastard. Yes. Yeah, there it is. All right, cool. Yeah. Now that we've and established I, that. And I can see like why he lived in London most of his life. Like if this <laughs> if this is a reflection of how he feels about America, I'm like, yeah, sure. Go live in London, man. Like enjoy your life. And on top of all that, I liked this movie, Bob. Yeah, I like, did too. I like it's funny, it's cutting, it's a black comedy, it's slow at times, but overall, like it, it worked for me. Like I just because I disagree with his political viewpoints. Doesn't mean I can't sit back and be like, man, when the pilot opens up the vault as they're talking about bombing Russia with atomic payloads and he, you, you expect him to pull out something important and like, you know, it's obviously under lock and key and he <laughs> sets his flight helmet down and pulls a cowboy hat out and puts yep. it on. Yep. I'm like, that was like probably one of the funniest moments of the film for me. I think that if you're going to do satire. And this gets back to the point we were making about horror last week. I think I, I said that I like to distinguish between like fun horror and mean horror. I think that fun satire is mean satire. Like if you're going to do satire, then you there's something societally that you think needs to be addressed. And if you're going to do it, you can't really be nice about it. Like, mm -hmm. you know, the the example that's always brought up with what is satire is that Jonathan Swift story, A Modest Proposal where he's talking about how the Irish are starving and recommends that they start eating babies to survive as a way of getting at the British for being dicks about withholding food to them. Mm -hmm. And I think that if you're going to do satire, it has to go all the way. And to your point, like, yeah, this might have something to do with why Kubrick doesn't like to come to America very often afterwards, because mm -hmm. he really does skewer everything. 
But I think that's part of why I don't want to say I excuse it, but it's part of why I'm like, I don't know that he hates America so much as like he he had to do his duty as a maker of satire because this movie would work significantly less if he tried to employ some of the charm, I guess, that you were saying, like with David Lean, like to your point, David Lean could never make this movie. I think that David Lean had too much propriety to make a movie like this. Mm -hmm. And to the extent that it works, Brad, it really, really works as satire. Yeah. And, and I think that one of the reasons it works is because he never tries to go in a different direction. Mm -hmm. That like he he doesn't try to have a moral of the story at the end of the movie. He doesn't try to like redeem anybody. He just puts the pedal to the metal from the first minute of the film and absolutely never lets up. And I think in a weird way, that's why it works. Like something that I, I've learned in my life from a good friend of mine, and I've seen it to be true, is that any time you are sarcastic or make a joke, it's a missed opportunity for sincerity. Hmm. And I think that you see that on display here, like to the nines. Mm -hmm. Like this movie is an exercise in how sarcasm and, you know, jokes at the expense of someone else are a missed opportunity at sincerity. And he could try to say something meaningful about the war, but instead he just wants to be mean and and kind of cut everybody down to the size he thinks that they really are. And because he never lets up on that and he never tries to pretend that he's doing anything else, it weirdly works for me. Like, like I've seen his true colors in this. Yeah. And I think, you know, not to push back too hard, but I think in some ways that is a show of sincerity. It's almost like I'd rather not have you be hot or cold kind of a thing. I or, or sorry, mm -hmm. I'd rather have you be hot or cold instead of lukewarm. I mm -hmm. think that the whole point of what you're saying is like, in general, when you make sarcastic comments, yes, you're missing an opportunity for sincerity. But that's because in everyday life, we are mingling, we're mixing sincere comments with sarcastic comments. Whereas mm -hmm. in Kubrick's case, the fact that there is none of that muddying up, it actually allows the sarcasm to make a point. And I think that he makes his point really, really clearly with if you're going to skewer America, you got to go all the way with it, because what he's ultimately trying to do is enforce this point that like this nuclear arms race is a farce. It is mm -hmm. like, you know, uh, sound and fury signifying nothing kind of a thing. And yet these guys have their fingers on the trigger of bombs that will destroy us all. And if you want to get through to them, like no amount of passionate hand wringing is going to do it. You got to make them look like idiots. And that's what's going to offend them enough to maybe put the bombs down for a second. There's a there's a moment at the very end of the movie when they have already dropped an atomic bomb in Russia. And it is very clear that the doomsday machine is going to go off. And instead of doing something to like hide to go underground, they're talking about maybe we can restart civilization and immediately. General Turgidson, uh, George C. Scott, he stands up, he starts shouting because he's so conditioned with this arms race mentality that he starts thinking, well, maybe the Russians are also going to have mines underground and their mines can't be better than ours. And he stands up and he says, we cannot afford to have a, a mine shaft gap. And it's just like it's very clear. It's like one of the last things said in the movie that. No matter what, these guys are so conditioned to only think of things as a competition that even if you even if you have this mutually assured destruction till the very last minute, they're only going to be thinking about how they can come out on top. And I think that, like, it is a mean movie and it is a hard point to make. But especially in the middle of the Cold War, I think it was a really important point to make. Then I guess my curiosity is like. Did this even have an impact? Hmm. Like, that's the question at the end of the day. Like, if he's trying to actually facilitate change, it, you know, it's just my belief that you don't make uh, people change their minds by being an ass to them. Mm -hmm. And so that that's my curiosity at the end of the day. Like, if his goal is just to make a funny movie that makes people laugh, sure. Like, he made a funny movie that can make you laugh at the ridiculousness. But if his goal is to actually create change in the minds of these leaders, I don't I don't know if this would be the most effective of tools. It just doesn't strike me as something that I would watch as a general in the Air Force and be like, ha, ha, 
<laughs> I oh, should change wow. my ways. What yeah. a what a d- guy I am. I I shouldn't be such an idiot. Yeah, I you know, God, Brad, I didn't think we'd be talking about the philosophical nature of satire throughout this episode, but like <laughs> you know, think back to the Jonathan Swift thing again. I don't think that he's writing that to convince, you know, the those in power to release more food. I think what he's trying to do is sway his audience against those people. And I think it's the same thing. You know, there's a movie that came out a few years ago called Don't Look Up, which was also a satire, which I think is way less effective than this movie. But everyone that had a Netflix account seemed to watch that movie over like a two week span, the week, the weeks after it came out. And I remember seeing tons of people being like, this movie makes a very clear point. I'm very upset. I'm very like for the first time, I'm realizing how tenuous this all is. And so I think as a filmmaker, Yes, you're right. You're probably not going to convince the people who you are actively offending. But especially in a democracy, like if you make the general public think we need to think more deeply about who we're putting in office, then, yeah, I don't know. Maybe you did your job. Yeah, it's just something I ponder when I watch films like this. Brad, you are known for your pondering. I think deeply. Mm, You sure do, man. And I think it's time for us to think deeply about something other than the philosophical nature of satire. We haven't even talked about the direction in this movie. We haven't talked about the performances. So we're going to go completely topsy-turvy today. But before we do that in the back half, let's take a break and try this old Bardstown. What do you say? Let's get to it. All right, so today we are checking out Old Bardstown Kentucky Straight Bourbon Whiskey. This is a bottled-in-bond bourbon from Willet Distillery. Brad, it's been a minute since we've had a Willet product. Got that funk, baby. Mm. Now, this one is actually distilled by the Willet Distillery, whereas some of the older ones that we've tried, like Noah's Mill and Rowan's Creek, were sourced. And uh, important asterisk here, they are now being released as Willet Distillate. but I digress. This product is distilled at Willet, so I have no idea if it's going to carry that signature rose petal funkiness that I love in my Willet products. But I will say this is a value pour that people really seem to like. So if you go to Kentucky, there are a number of brands released by Willet that you can't really get many places other than Kentucky. There's one called Pure Kentucky, which I mean, yeah, that makes sense. There's Old Bardstown, (laughs) and then there's also an Old Bardstown that is 101 proof. Now, when I went there, I really wanted to try the 101 proof. I looked at the shelf and saw that it was $45 and that the 100 proof bottled in bond version was $20. I heard an old wives tale like, uh, you know, insider trading about why they offer a product at 100 proof and why they offer a product at 101 proof. I don't know what the validity of that is, but I can't imagine that there's that much difference between there's this four year product at 100 proof and the non-age stated version at 101 proof and it saved me 25 bucks so brad we're trying the cheap stuff today yeah we sure are and i you kind of screwed the screwed the order up here bob we switched whiskeys right before we started so i am (laughs) drinking this live i am as well yeah i had a scotch slated in for today and then i was like wait a minute we need to drink something that's like (laughs) hardcore american and we yes. had we had this on the on the docket for next week. So I just said, let's uh, let's do the old switcheroo. Yeah. So do I have your permission, Bob? Can I can I press the button to move us into the nosing notes? The doomsday machine commences, Brad. Pull the trigger. Yeah, go for it. So the nose here is fascinating. I, like the ethanol is definitely prominent. Like it is a cheap 100 proof whiskey. You're going to get some ethanol on the nose. But once you get past that, it definitely has lots of like really artificially sweet cherry. And I normally do not do this, Bob, but I'm just going to steal notes from somebody else. (laughs) On their website, they call it the, the notes that they give say that it's a fun dip cherry. And I have to say, if you have ever had fun dip candy, this is it. Like... Mm. It's 100% artificial, sweet, cherry, flavoring, sugary goodness. Mm -hmm. Uh, I I think it smells interesting, but the heavy ethanol kind of throws me off. I'll give it a 6 out of 10. I like your notes, and I like the notes that you stole as well. I don't know if that would be like the first thing I think of on this. 
For me, you're right. The ethanol is pretty prominent. When you cut through that, though, it is it's like as if you mixed the Willet Funk bourbon with like a regular standard bourbon. Like it's got all of the vanilla and caramel. It does have a ton of cherry. So it kind of reminds me of a weeded bourbon, but then it has just a hair of that rose petally, funky, you know, like barn wood kind of a thing to it. I really like it, but I'm I'm a little curious because it doesn't tip totally into classic bourbon and it also doesn't tip totally into like the Willet Funk. And so it kind of seems like it's not doing either to the best it could do. So I'm going to give it a seven and a half on the nose and just kind of hope for the best as we go here. Yeah, as you get into the flavor, I think that they're – this is like one of the first $20 whiskeys we've had in a long time where I'm like, yeah, this should be at $20. Hmm. And and that's my palate notes. <laughs> 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 like, it, it's fine. It's decent. There's a little bit of nuttiness going on. The artificial cherry sweetener kind of comes through. Uh, I think it gets a little bit grainy throughout. It's a tiny bit sour on my tongue. Mm-hmm. This is a this is through and through a twenty dollar whiskey, Bob. Now it could be Brad that I you know I just took my first sip and it's my first sip of whiskey for the whole day. So maybe my palate's just waking up. Tell me if I'm wrong here. I took a sip and I didn't notice a single thing on my tongue except a kind of a vaguely sour note. And then I mm-hmm. swallowed and all of a sudden all the flavor like exploded on my tongue. It was a really weird tasting experience. It takes a minute for it to come through. That's for sure. It has a really oily mouthfeel, which is really nice. Like, I like the fact that it coats my palate. It just doesn't have a lot of character to it. And that sour note towards the end, it tips closer to malt than it does to rye for me. And I have no idea if there's even any barley in this mash bill. But... It's man, it's just way out of left field in terms of the palate as opposed to the nose. I'm not a huge fan of the flavor here. I think I'm just going to give it a six and a half out of ten. Yeah, the flavor is not my favorite. I, I'm a little below you at a five and a half. And I think that the finish is where this really kind of falls off for me. Wait, 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 wait. Did you say a five and a half? Yeah. Wow. That might be your yeah. lowest score in any category all season. They might be. We've been drinking a lot of good whiskey, Bob. Wow. Apparently, this is not one of them. Yeah, this one's just not impressing me very much. I I think that the finish falls off the most. It gets very sour and grainy and alcohol-y. And I I weirdly think that this might benefit from being a little bit lower proof. Mm. I think that if you cut it down some, it might have a little better flavor. But as it is, the, the oakiness just turns bitter for me by the end. Uh, it's not the worst finish I've ever had, but I'll give it a five out of 10. Yeah, I'm just going to give it a six out of 10 on the finish. I'm in the same place you are. That sour note is really coming through. I don't know what exactly is going on here, but this doesn't have the sort of roundness that I would expect from a four year bourbon. And I think I'm understanding now why it's $20. And that takes me to the balance, which I think I'll also just give a six out of 10. This was kind of all over the place. The nose promised something that the palate didn't deliver. The finish was just off. A six actually might be kind of generous. Maybe I'll just give it a five on balance, Brad. Yeah, I, I give it a six out of 10 on balance. I, I don't think this promises very much at the start, and then it delivers on that promise. So, uh, you know, it, it's okay balanced as far as the the general experience. I think I'm interested by your score for the value category. Because at the end of the day, like, this is only $20. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, we we have other options at $20 that I would go to first, but it's not going to set you back very many to to try this. I think pricing your whiskey at $20 gets you an automatic six or higher. Like, I just don't yeah. know that you can. It could be the worst whiskey in the world. And you're if you only spent 20 bucks, you don't feel like you wasted that much money on it. Mm hmm. How much better than a six is this is the question. And I know you tell me that I overthink value all the time Mm -hmm. because there is there is one way to approach it, which is your way, which is like, how much would I pay for this based on how it tastes? And I think that's perfectly valid. I try to balance that with like, let's also look at the market for this kind of whiskey. Let's look at its competitors. How is it priced? I think that a bottled and bond bourbon for 20 bucks, I don't actually know 
Evan Williams bottled and bond might be the only other one I can think of. Uh, old granddad, maybe those are like the only three I can really think of that are twenty dollar bottled and bond bourbons. And so with those as the competitors, I don't think this is like markedly worse than those two whiskeys. I don't really care for either of those two whiskeys. So I guess I'll give it a 7.5 on value, but I can't go any higher because I just don't think it's that great. Yeah, I think I'll give it a 6.5 on value. Uh, like, like you said, you can't get much below a 6, 7 out of 10 if it's $20. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, you're talking about something like Canadian Mist, and it's like, yeah, sure, 12 bucks. Like, you know, it's not the best whiskey in the world, but you only spent $12. Yeah, and also, like, what do you expect from a whiskey? Like, they're telling you by pricing Mm -hmm. it at $12, this is Mm -hmm. not going to blow your mind. Right. So I'll give it a six and a half. I think it's an okay value. I think that if you are looking to expand your understanding of the entire world of whiskey from top to bottom... This is a worthwhile $20 to spend. And that's going to bring my total out to a 29 out of 50, Bob. Oof. It's never good when you have a uh, a score in the 20s. Mm-hmm. I'm at a 32 and a half, which takes us to a 61.5 out of 100 or a 30.75 out of 50. And I actually think that's a pretty good spot for this. Like the the whiskey itself is probably below a six out of 10 if I was just grading it that way. But when you Mm -hmm. factor value into it, I think that like a 60 ish range is pretty good for this. Yeah, I I would agree. Would you recommend buying or trying? Um, If you know what you're getting into, I would say buy it. Hmm. I would not recommend trying it. Yeah, I would. This would like at minimum, this would cost three or four dollars to try at the bar. And I I don't think two ounces is is worth three or four bucks. No, this is a really good like, I don't want to use my good bourbon as a mixer. So I'm going to use this as a mixer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, it's fine. It is a fine bottled and bond bourbon. There are much better options out there. So old Bardstown, you have uh, you've kind of let us down, man. But the real question that Stanley Kubrick would have us ask, would you make love to it, Bob? Mm. Let's find out my answer in this next segment, Brad. What do you say? (laughs) Our brand new segment, Would Bob Make Love to It? (laughs) Let's get to it. All right, everybody. That was Old Bardstown, a whiskey that we will never talk about again on the podcast. Mm. Unless we try the 101 proof. Who knows how much better that might be? Uh, Hopefully it's $25 better. (laughs) It's fascinating, Bob, because this movie has such a strong, you know, Cold War, Soviet versus the U.S. connection. At the end of the day, I don't even know if Canada wants to be associated with this segment. That's true. They they are a peaceful people, but they do like it when we get contentious with our next segment, which we call Two Facts and a Falsehood. Brad is going to try to stump you, Bob, to our right. And what is wrong? Two facts and a falsehood. Two facts and a falsehood is the part of the show where Brad presents three items to me as fact about the making of this movie, one of which is a complete lie and fabrication. Brad, I uh, I feel like I know quite a bit about this movie, so I hope you did your research today to try to stump me, because I'm also on a hot streak here. Bob, I'm going to give you a fact about two facts and a falsehood. Hmm. This is the very first time in my history of creating Two Facts and a Falsehood where I wrote my falsehood before I watched the movie. Oh, and it still holds up. Still holds up, baby. All right. Well, let's see what you got, man. Hit me with your two facts and a falsehood. Fact number one, Dr. Strangelove's glove is from Stanley Kubrick's personal collection. Peter Sellers had seen Kubrick wearing them to handle hot lights on the set and thought and mentioned to Kubrick that they looked sinister. Mm. Fact number two, in one version of the script, angels and demons watched all of the action of the film together and all agreed at the end of the film that humans were better off without them interfering. Mm. Okay. Fact number three, the scene where General Turgidson trips and falls in the war room and then gets back up and resumes talking as if nothing happened truly was an accident. Kubrick mistakenly thought that it was George C. Scott really in character, so he left it in the film. 
Welp. How much do you know now, Bobby? I feel like number two is the only one that you could have written before you saw the movie, since I assume you knew nothing going into the movie about the movie. Mm. Right? Yep. Perhaps. I mean, how much did you know about this movie, man? Here's the question for you, Bob. Was I lying to you about my fact? Oh, don't. Ah, I can trust <laughs> no one now. Why, why do you do this to me? <laughs> Uh, it's two facts and a falsehood, man. The the whole thing is that I'm lying to you. All right, the fa- I think the falsehood is either one or two. I'm just gonna go with my gut and say two's the falsehood. That's it. Yeah, that's all I got. Man, normally we get great great uh, vamping off of this. No, Bob. no just, more banter. We've been talking about go- <laughs> weird stuff all day, man. I'm trying to I'm trying to rein myself in at this point. Number two is the falsehood, Robert. <laughs> You shouldn't have told me you wrote it beforehand, because then I was like, all right, which one sounds the least related to the film? Yeah, you are correct. So I'm 13 and 10 on the season now, man. Dude, you're on a roll. You're killing it, Bob. What a day. What a day in the book household. Glorious day. Has anything else happened in the book household to (laughs) lift things up? No, nothing this great. This is this is the (laughs) the peak of my day so far. This, This is the height of luxury. All right, let's talk about this movie in terms of the direction and the performances. Let's start with the performances. I think they're more fun to talk about here, Brad. And you can't really go very far in this movie without talking about Peter Sellers, who plays three different roles and is absolutely incredible in all three roles. And not only is he incredible in all three roles, there's a style of comedy that Sellers, you know, he was a a huge improviser. And Kubrick kind of let him run wild a little bit with this movie, but it makes the movie age so well because comedy has tilted that way in the last 20 years, whether it be like the Adam McKay, Will Ferrell movies, or just like the kind of uh, improvisation that looks like real life that you got with shows like The Office or Parks and Rec. And I think that like if if the predominant mode of comedy in this country was still sitcom comedy like Seinfeld, this movie might seem kind of out of left field still the same way that we talked about with uh, like Spinal Tap. But because I could see, you know, a Steve Carell playing these roles, Mm -hmm. I have a context for Peter Sellers. And then I have an understanding of how far ahead of his time he was. And I think it's just an absolutely incredible performance. Yeah, I I think that One of the things that stuck out to me was how this film felt incredibly relevant or familiar. I'll I'll use the word familiar. Like, none of the comedy in this film felt out of left field for me. Mm -hmm. Like, it felt like this is a direct grandfather to almost all the comedy that we have in, you know, the 21st century. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think that Peter Sellers then has an incredible ability in this film to be sincerely ridiculous and inept throughout the entirety of the movie. Mm -hmm. Well, that if I'm being honest with you, Bob, I did not realize that he was playing three different characters. Really? Till just now? No. Yeah. Nope. I thought that he was just the, uh, the president. He was the president. He was Dr. Strangelove and he was the British, uh, officer. Ah, Look at that. He was all three. I think it's not helpful that if I'm correct, I believe on on IMDb, they don't list him as multiple characters. (laughs) They just just picked one and stuck with it? Yeah, because when I looked it up, I'm pulling it up right now. It just lists him as the president, maybe? (laughs) President Merkin Muffley. The, yeah, I, the greatest name of all time. <laughs> it's 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 a pretty pretty great great name. So that that for me was that's a surprise, Bob. I did not know that. I love that these three roles allow him to play like the entire range of his comedy chops. So like as the British officer, he's very demure and he's you know he very clearly thinks that this man is crazy, but he's really scared, but he can't break like his British politeness, and so he's. He's just kind of, you know, hanging out in a mousy way as the president. He's playing kind of the mousy version of an American, but he's got that sort of like New Englander, you know, like I don't want to. He's obviously not a parallel to Kennedy, but like he's in that vein. 
And then as Strange Love, it's just like a complete Saturday Night Live character. You know, he's just riffing on all the people in the U.S. government who were former Nazis who were also in charge of the nuclear arms. And he's just doing like the most Nazi Nazi that you could possibly do. And I think it's really <laughs> funny because some of the characters are like spot on lifelike characters and some of them are complete over the top, you know, spoofs. But they all three work in the context of the movie. And I think that for me, now that I know that he played three characters, I think my favorite character really is Dr. Strangelove. Like, he does such a good job of keeping things under wraps throughout the film, and you don't really interact with Dr. Strangelove until the end of the film. And dude, that final scene when he's in the wheelchair and just trying to spout Nazi crap and and like keep it under wraps as long as he can and mm-hmm. it finally just bursts out in the form of a Heil Hitler. Yeah. It's it's one of the funniest moments in cinema. Yeah, it's really I, good. Like I literally lost it. It was so funny. I also think though that he's able to be ridiculous because everybody else in the cast is playing like they're playing idiots, but they're playing such believable idiots that it anchors everything. And this time through, I was shocked at how good George C. Scott was in this movie. He is so freaking funny. Like, it is unbelievable what comedy chops this guy had. Because it's, you can play like the meathead, ex-football player, gym teacher type. And it's like funny, but not believable. And then there's a way that he just like embodies it. He just embodies Mm -hmm. the like, I only think with my dick all the time. And I chew gum aggressively (laughs) and I say things I shouldn't say out loud. And like he just lives into it so much. It's crazy how good he is in this movie. Yeah, I think George C. Scott was my favorite actor in the film. And it's because out of all the characters that Kubrick creates in this movie, he is the most ridiculous and most extreme of them all. And it just he is emblematic of the entire movie as a whole. Mm. And I, I think that George C. Scott just goes full sail, like into the character of Turgidson and and completely loses himself in the role. Like we we talk about chewing scenery every once in a while. Like this man defines chewing scenery. Oh, a hundred percent. And then you also have Sterling Hayden, who is, I mean, playing the like the least purposely funny character like he's playing jack you know jack t ripper the uh the general who no. goes crazy and he's really haunting and menacing and they play a lot of those scenes for laughs but the the comedy is really buried and so like so much of the comedy in those scenes is watching peter sellers face and like him trying to walk on eggshells with this clearly deranged man but then you get the big reveal He says, like, hey, where did you develop this conspiracy? And he reveals that, you know, it was in the act of lovemaking and he 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 couldn't get there with whoever he was making love to. And it just set him off on this complete conspiracy theory about bodily fluids and having a pure race. And it's a believable break from reality. And it is really funny. But you could take all of those scenes and put them in a movie that is completely serious and they would all still work. And I think that's why I love that performance so much, because it's a really committed performance and he's not winking at the camera at all while he's doing it. And it also like comes from what I think is the funniest joke of the movie. And it's a joke that I'm not totally sure Kubrick was meaning to make. But as somebody from the Midwest, Ohio specifically, when they're on the plane and they key in the specific code. That's the only code that will be received by the plane. It's O-P-E. Yeah. Which is essentially the Midwest of way of saying like, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to run into you there. Or, or oh, sorry, I, I, I sent this email on accident. Or it's just kind of that polite Midwest expression. And I'm like, it, did Kubrick know that? But at the end of the day, I choose to believe that that is absolutely brilliant. And I just thought it was the the absolute funniest joke. I had to like pause it. I was laughing so hard when they keyed that in. I'm shocked at how much this movie made me laugh out loud. And I've seen this movie a few times and it's kind of always worked for me, but it's never worked perfectly for me. And I think this time through it worked as perfectly as it's going to work. Like, I don't I don't know if I'm going to give it a 10 out of 10 today, Brad, but it is a damn good comedy. 
And I think that if we want to talk Kubrick just for a hot second, I think that what I was really impressed by, again, is the camera movements in this movie and how he was able to get inside a cockpit and and come up with 80 million different camera angles inside inside a crowded space like that. But then also like the scenes of the fort getting sieged and uh, there's like almost like World War II documentary style handheld cameras outside. And, you know, the plane looks really fake. But I think that that also kind of helps the comedy of the whole thing. Like I was just really impressed by the different styles of filmmaking that he wove together to make a cohesive movie here. Yeah, I mean, especially the the military fighting sequences in which the Americans are fighting the Americans mm-hmm. to try to stop the Americans from bombing Russia. <laughs> I I think that some of those scenes stand up for how short they are as like truly incredibly well-made war fighting scenes. Mm-hmm. Like those would stand up with almost any other World War II movie out there as far as like dynamic action and you know the geography of the fight and you know the stakes that are at play and there's something about it that's just brilliant and incredibly well shot and well made i think while i admire kubrick the director and how he's able to get these performances out of all of his actors i think this might be the time that i say like kubrick the writer is really on point here because he knows how to balance different styles of comedy and how to be really mean, but then to also balance that with these ridiculous names for his characters like Merck and Muffley. And, you know, to get back to The Great Dictator again, it reminds me of how Chaplin, I think to less great effect, was able to balance some of the like the pathos of that movie with the fact that like you know, Hitler's right hand man was named garbage and uh, the, mm-hmm. uh, the other country was named bacteria or whatever. Like you have to have <laughs> silly elements to go along with the really biting satire if you're going to make the whole thing work. And I think Kubrick just does a really good job as writer here. Yeah, the the level of of comedy on the jokes that he writes in here is really incredible. It definitely hits just the perfect chord of biting, gross, like just mean comedy that you still want to laugh at. Mm -hmm. And I I think that's what works so well about his, his script here. I just love like the etiquette of the president on the phone with the Russian premier. And you never hear what he's saying, (laughs) but he's just like, well now Dimitri, like I'm doing my best here, you know, like don't get mad. And and, like, they're talking about bombing his country with a nuclear weapon. And he's Mm -hmm. like, well, what do you want me to do? Dimitri? Like, it's just, it's so funny to hear the different styles of comedy come up in the dialogue in this movie. And Brad, before I go on too long about how funny I think this movie is, I do think it's time for us to get into our last segment of the day, which we call Let's Make It a Double. We're near the end of the episode, so thanks for listening to the Film and Whiskey Show. Let's pair another film with this one, even if it's struggling. It's the final segment of the day, now let's make it a double. Let's Make It a Double is the part of the show where we pair this movie up with another one to make the perfect double feature. I'll get mine out of the way real quick. It's The Great Dictator. I think that The Great Dictator ends on a hopeful note, and then 20 years later, in the middle of the nuclear Cold War and arms race, Uh, People seem to have a lot less hope that things were going to turn out great. And so this movie ends with the world getting blown up. So I think if you want a complete uh, 180 on satire and its intended aims, you can watch The Great Dictator and Dr. Strangelove. Yeah, that's a great pick, man. Like, it definitely gives you the, the most facetious take on World War II and on the Cold War that I think you're going to get in mm-hmm. cinematic history. Yep. I think for me, the movie that this reminds me of the most, and it's not necessarily a biting satire or or comedy, but it definitely feels to the world of musical biopics what Dr. Strangelove or How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love the Bomb is to Cold War movies. I think that this is Spinal Tap. Just there's something about it that hits the same ridiculous, asinine over-the-top seriousness that is really funny that you have here in Dr. Strange Love or How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love the Bomb. Hmm. Now, there is another movie that I think would make a pretty obvious double feature. We have not had time to talk about it on this episode, but it's a movie that also came out in 1964 called Failsafe. 
This is a movie directed by Sidney Lumet, starring Henry Fonda and Walter Matthau, and it is essentially the same story here. Uh, the U.S. government is surprised to learn that they are unable to recall a flight that they have on its way to bomb Moscow with a nuclear weapon. And it's all about how all of these fail safes that they built into the system are actually pretty flimsy and pretty fragile. And they that one is a very tense, dramatic movie. And there's a cool story behind it, Brad, that I, I mean, I'll give you a five second rundown of it. But like the source material for Dr. Strangelove is a book. Then the failsafe book came out and it was so similar that the author of the first book sued the failsafe guy and <laughs> Kubrick found out they were making failsafe at the same time he was making Dr. Strangelove. And so then he sued them saying, like, my source material was stolen by you guys. Now you're going to steal my movie, too. They basically settled out of court because that was an independently funded movie. Columbia bought the rights to that movie so that they could own both movies. And then Kubrick insisted, you got to release mine first so that I get more money out of this. And then they threw <laughs> Failsafe out at the end of the year and it didn't really make that much money because it was the same movie as Dr. Strangelove. But from all accounts, I've heard Failsafe is an incredible movie. I've never gotten a chance to watch it, uh, but I think it would be a pretty interesting double feature. Dude, every time you tell a story about Kubrick's personal life, he just sounds like the worst. Oh, yeah. I, I'm i not a huge fan of Stanley Kubrick, as I have mentioned many times here. Yeah. And, and the funny thing is, I feel like I had that vibe of him before I ever did this podcast <laughs> and like learned more about cinematic history. Like as somebody who had never seen a Kubrick film, to my knowledge, I still somehow knew when we started talking about him on the podcast that he was just kind of a dick. Mm hmm. And and I feel like that was a very astute observation, Brad. <laughs> you know me, astute observer of the human race. All right, man, let's give this movie some final scores. I think the only thing for me about this movie that I wouldn't give a 10 out of 10 to is the last like 10 minutes after the bomb goes off and we cut back to the war room and they're just kind of calmly talking about the survival of the race. I feel like I'm missing something there. And there was actually a scene filmed for the ending of this movie, where instead of it ending as abruptly as it does, they actually have a gigantic pie fight. Like there's a food fight at the end of the movie in the war room. And then the kinda, bombs go off. Kind of like the great dictator. Almost exactly. <laughs> so, so Kubrick cut it out. And I think that was wise. But I also feel like there's just something rushed about the way this movie ends. Like it, it feels like it's missing a few beats, a few moments in every line of dialogue. And, uh, I think the first 85 minutes of the movie are perfect. And I think the last seven minutes are like pretty good. And so it sucks that that's the last note that the movie leaves you on. I'm still going to give this movie a nine and a half out of 10. That's interesting. I, I don't think that this movie is quite that good. Mm. I, I think that there's definitely places, as I've said before, where it just kind of drags, where it feels like, all right, you've made your point. Like, let's move on to the next scene. I think that the the message of the movie also just frankly doesn't resonate with me. And so while I think that the comedy works, it makes sense, you know the message that Kubrick is trying to to relay, I just I just think it's fine. Uh I'm going to give it an 8 out of 10, Bob. Brad, that puts us pretty much in line with where this movie sits on IMDb. It is currently, I believe, the number 72 movie of all time at an 8.4 on average. We're coming out to a much higher 8.75 between the two of us, and I think that's a good spot for it. But I'd really like to know what Film and Whiskey Nation thinks. Have you guys seen Dr. Strangelove? How does it hold up after almost 60 years of release? You can find us and let us know on our social medias, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube at Film Whiskey. Or you can jump onto the Discord. We are on there every single day talking to you guys, the fans of the Film and Whiskey podcast. So join the conversation. You can find a link to our Discord at the end of every single one of our show notes. Next week, we're rounding out Kubrick month, or I guess Kubrick three weeks, with Paths of Glory, perhaps my favorite Stanley Kubrick movie. I'll, I'll watch it again and I'll report back, Brad, but I'm, I'm excited to watch that one with you. So join us next week for Paths of Glory. But until then, I'm Bob Book. I'm Brad G. And we'll see you next time. <laughs>